a time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running, I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the last. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they've seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. With us today, we are going to be worshiping together, so I hope you had a chance to check out the announcement slides as we did our countdown. Uh, if you haven't yet, well, you can go on our Facebook page and be able to see everything that's updated. We've had to totally change all the announcements so that way everything's online and mobile, so we want to make sure you uh, stay caught up on that. There are three things that I want to make sure I mention today. One specifically is Susie Swanson has uh, made sure that she made Kids Discovery a uh, priority, and she's actually put in the comments that you'll see above uh, this video and being able to see a basically a lesson for your children. So if you would like to be able to use that, that's a resource for you. There's also some links in regard to how do you talk to your kids about the COVID-19 and being able to do that. So I want to encourage you, use those resources available. Uh, the next thing is we have a new ministry. It's called Lent a Hand for Easter, and you'll see that event also on our Facebook page. Basically, we want to encourage people to be able to serve others during this time, and if you're going to the store and would like to pick up some extra things for somebody in need, we want to be able to communicate that. So you can check out the details again on our Facebook page. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that I want to invite you for coffee. Now, I know the coffee places are shut down, right? But basically, what we want to do is do Facebook Live, and we're just going to have coffee for an hour. Thursdays, 7.30 a.m., uh, be able to enjoy time together. Uh, I'll have a brief devotion. We'll be able to pray together and just kind of interact via Facebook Live and be able to enjoy that time. Since we can't meet together, we'll meet online. So that's what we're going to do. With that said, I'm excited about today's worship. We're going to be able to have a great time together. Uh, as always, we're going to be able to worship and have communion. Uh, offering will be available online, and so all those things will still be happening as elements of our service today. But I want to welcome you into it. Uh, stand with us, turn up the volume, and get ready to worship. God bless you. Let's have a great service together.
One thing I'm so thankful for is that God has really blessed us with amazing technology to be able to do this. Even though we are physically not together, we can tune in together and we can have communion together. If you haven't had a chance yet, um, feel free to get some bread and juice ready as we prepare our hearts for communion. Um, and after we sing the communion song, we will be playing it a little longer so that you have some time to reflect. Ephesians 2, 11 through 18. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Therefore, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit.
for this time of offering, we just want to direct you to the church website where you can give online or you can mail your offering to the church since we aren't able to collect it here. We also want to thank you so much for your generosity in these uncertain times. We believe our God is still at work in this church, which is you. Many of you have been so generous, and we ask for you to continually be faithful in your giving to keep ministry like this alive and well. In celebration of how generous our God is, we want to share with you this powerful song. I really love the message it conveys. The Holy Spirit is living in us. He reaches out to mankind, provides for all our needs, makes a way for us, performs miracles, keeps his promises, and defeats darkness with his light. He will one day wipe all tears from believers' eyes when we enter his heavenly kingdom. Let's sing Waymaker together.
Dear God, thank you so much that we have the privilege of being to, of being able to worship together despite these circumstances. Just please bless our time together and please give us wisdom on how we can help people in need and help our community and just please help us to grow together as a church even though all of this is happening. Thank you so much for your love and thank you so much for giving us something to hold on to, for giving us hope amidst all of this chaos. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. Well, like I said, good morning. It's so good to be with you today. Uh, we are going to be wrapping up our John series in John chapter uh, 13. But what we're going to do is we're going to be staying in John until uh, through the end. We're going to be changing focus, though, and you'll be seeing that in the next weeks to come. Uh, but I'm just so glad that you're here online today and being able to just experience this with us. So um, here's where uh, I want to begin our, our topic for today. How, what do you think about when you think about shadows? Is there, uh, oh, thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. Forgot my clicker. We're going to need that later. Um, when you think about shadows, what are some of the things that you think about? For me, um, I kind of have a negative connotation when it comes to shadows. Like, for example, in movies, oftentimes the shadow will be used to kind of illustrate something bad that's happening, right? So the dark alley, the dim light, uh, different things that are going on, and all of a sudden you'll see the shadow of the bad guy, right? Or, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, shadows can be uh, in bedrooms. I know with our little uh, Hudson, he gets kind of scared at night, right? Because of a little teddy bear that can look so harmless and cute in the daylight. Shadows uh, can make it seem really scary. And my parents, you, you know this pretty well. Um, shadows can also be metaphorical. I mean, I think about in uh, the coronavirus season that we find ourselves in, right? We are all a little bit uh, overshadowed with the coronavirus. Even little Hudson, right? Here, here's a picture, two years old, and even he has to deal with the coronavirus. Now, this picture has got to be one of the most adorable pictures we have of Hudson. 
uh, <laughs> his nice cheeks, and he is just legitimately downcast. He's overshadowed because of this uh, coronavirus. Now, really to get the picture, what you need to understand is Becky had taken the kids out to go for a little walk. Of course, they were not on the playground because we know that's not the right thing to be doing. But with this, uh, you see in the background, look at the swing, okay? What he was excited about going, he doesn't realize about the coronavirus stuff. So he was thought he was going to go on the swing set and go play. When he got to the swing set and saw that the swing set is like tied together, it is impossible for anybody to be swinging on the swing set. And when Hudson saw that, he just was so downcast because of this reality. He was overshadowed with that. You know, uh, I, I just laugh at this picture because it is so two-year-old, like, mindset, like, bummer, <laughs> you know? Oh, man. But, you know, the reality is we're in a pretty serious time, you know? And so there's a lot of things that are, that are shadowing our lives right now. I mean, I think about um, from the various aspects of life to financial things, people are being laid off. Uh, you have uh, businessmen who are trying to make those hard decisions of layoffs and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, you have people that are uh, navigating their health and trying to figure out how do I stay healthy in the midst of the virus spreading. Uh, we have parents that are trying to keep their kids healthy and so, you know, not going on the playground, all those kinds of things. So this is all a part of what we're trying to figure out together. As we look at John chapter 13 today, uh, what I want us to be looking at is, or at least realizing, is that Jesus is facing a shadow. Now, his shadow is the cross. His shadow is this burden, this overarching burden that in, a, in hours, a matter of hours, he is going to be facing a betrayal and a denial it was some of the, the most favorite, most loved, most genuine guys that he's been dealing with, his disciples. And uh, we're going to look at two of those guys, Judas and Peter, today in the text. So if you have your Bibles, if you have um, you know, a, a cell phone or anything, you can flip there, and we'll be looking at this. But in considering what Jesus is getting ready to face, it really is such a tragic um, situation that Jesus is facing. But I just want to encourage you this morning. Wherever you find yourself, whatever overshadowing that is happening in your life, I just want to let you know that Jesus can meet you right where you are. Uh, the songs that we were singing earlier today and the, the worship time that we had is very reflective of that very thing, that he is a miracle worker, that he is um, the way and can be that way maker for you. Um, so as we get into the text today, we're going to begin reading in verse 16 and then kind of carry on through to verse 30. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and do this together. Verse 16, we, we see now that uh, Jesus is already talking about the last hour, so the death is coming. We see that uh, he has um, I already identified the foot washing. And so we know that he is serving uh, his disciples. He is making this high command of, of service and humility. Uh, and now as we get into verse 16, we see, uh, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. He is quoting Psalm 41, David's psalm, because a friend, even the closest friends that David's had, was betraying him. Well, he goes on to say, I'm telling you now, he says, I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it, when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. 
The word troubled in this text could literally mean he was horrified at this thought, right? He had been spending years with these guys. He had been teaching them, loving on them, serving them. They'd been doing life together and even feeding them in different times. And now this foot washing has just taken place. He has just done the most humiliating, humble act any other adult can do to another one, let alone a lord to his, te- to his pupils. And now, very truly, one of you is going to betray me? You can imagine the awkwardness in that moment. Everybody is shocked. Everybody is confused. Wait, what? What is going on, Jesus? What what do you mean? Verse 22, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of of them, the disciple who Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now, we, we know this would be John. And so uh, John is laying next to, to Jesus, and then Peter asks him, which one does he mean? John asked him. And so in verse 25, leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? You can almost imagine because of the awkwardness, there's a, almost a whisper, uh, Lord, would you tell me who is it? Jesus replied, it is the one whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping in the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. What these next verses indicate is that there was no idea, the, the room had no clue who, what exactly was happening or what was Judas really supposed to be doing. Verse 28 says, but no one in the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had been in charge of the money, some thought that Jesus was telling him to buy what needed to be uh, bought for the festival and, or maybe give some to the poor. Verse 30 tells us, though, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And it was night. Now, there's a couple of things that I want us to spend some time thinking about. We'll pause there and then we'll finish out the the chapter. But what I see in this is just remarkable. Let's try to put ourselves in the situation, okay? Again, we've already been talking about three years working and doing ministry together, living together, eating together, doing life together. These disciples had given up everything they had to follow Jesus, And now in this upper room, Jesus has just done the most humble act another could do. Imagine they're they're actually not just sitting at a table like uh, American style. They would have been laid on, on, kind of laid out, stretched out, uh, with their heads close to the table, their feet away from the table. They would have been sitting on pillows and blankets and other things and at, at a low sitting table. And they would have been kind of eating off of the table. Kind of gets you the, the setting of the, the place. And, and now Jesus, again, is telling them that someone among them are going to betray him. Now, you can imagine in this moment, Jesus has already told them that the hour has come. And so not only is he going to die, but now someone's going to betray him. And we're going to see here pretty soon that Peter is going to deny him three times. And so, can you imagine what they would be asking? Put yourself in that situation. You've just given up everything to follow this guy, and now you're saying, he's saying he's going to die? Am I going to have to die too? Is it my last hour? Is the one that I thought was the Messiah, the one who was certainly going to be the guy that was going to be the ruler and political leader and the Messiah that we all want to conquer, was that all misled? The, the doubts that would begin to creep in and, and the concern, am I the one who's going to betray him? In fact, in Mark 14, we actually see the accounts of all the disciples sort of in the shock of, is it me, Lord? Is it me? And so we find ourselves in this, in this kind of very shadowy, kind of dark place in the upper room where there's a lot of contention and confusion. And of course, we see the, the curious panic of Peter asking John, and John asked Jesus, and, and you know, uncertainty with this. Well, we see in verse 30, he runs out into the night. Judas runs out into the night, and I just can't help but, but remember what Jesus says in, in verse 11, or excuse me, chapter 11, verse 9. During the day, 
people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world, but at night there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Jesus is letting us know kind of in advance that the night is not a good place to be, and yet Judas runs out into the night. He is going to stumble. You know, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from the life of Judas, but one of the things I want us to take away in this little moment is not actually of Judas, but of Satan. I want us to think about this for a minute. Satan desires to sabotage Jesus' followers. You know, when you think of, of all the people that he would want to target, not only just a Christ follower, but a white, hot follower of Jesus, somebody who is close to him, especially maybe those who are close walking with Jesus. Because if the, he can get them, then it breaks down the testimony and it breaks down the very thing that Jesus desires is that relationship. Well, as we continue on, I think one of the points that we can take here is that's why Jesus makes this command. You know, notice uh, in 30, verse 34, he says, I have a new command to give you. What's ironic about this, it's not actually a new command. In Leviticus, it tells us that we should be loving each other. But this part is new. I, I give you the new command, love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. What has he just got done doing? Washing the disciples' feet. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What he's saying, what Jesus is, is, is telling us here is that when we are in the act of loving one another the way that Christ loves us, or being or receiving the way that Christ loves us, it is almost as if that keeps Satan at bay to be able to command this. That is the strongest tense that he can use to say, this is not an option, this is emphatic, this is what we are called to do. Because he knows that Satan desires to sabotage his followers. And he will do whatever it takes to be able to do that. See, for Judas, here's what I want us to see. For Judas, a wholehearted love for Jesus became wholehearted self-love. When we consider what, Jesus, what Judas did and selling him out 30 pieces of silver, it was a self-love. If, if we can begin to kind of think through the situation a little bit. I mean, remember in the verses, the disciples didn't know what was happening. They didn't realize what Jesus was actually saying to Judas. The only two people in the room that knew Judas's heart was Judas and Jesus. That's it. Everything looked good on the outside. Everything looked just like how it was supposed to, and yet at some point, there was a veering. At some point when he was supposed to be going straight, he took a right turn and started going on his own way. Though the actions looked very similar, his heart began to change. I appreciate this, this uh, quote uh, from uh, D.L. Bartlett, Judas is the reminder that every day is judgment day, and that on any day, some faithful follower like Judas, or like you and me, might turn tail on the light and settle and, and stumble out into the darkness, caught up in evil, or caught by the evil's prince. You know, it is a sobering reality. You know, the power of this occasion again, the, the time that they had together, the fact that Judas was called out by Jesus to be one of the twelve. He, he served him, loved him, honored him, even warned him in verse 10, uh, though not everyone was clean, right? He, he had mentioned that earlier in verse 18. He even prophesied that this was going to be happening. And yet still, Judas didn't want what Jesus was offering. 
Well, if you know the story, he sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. He goes to the garden, kisses Jesus, which is the signal. The guards come in, they take Jesus away, and the crucifixion begins. Meanwhile, Judas realizes what he had done, regrets everything that he'd done. He tries to give the money back. The Pharisees don't want it because they know it's blood money. And he finds himself in a dark place wondering who in the world would ever forgive me for this. My Lord, my teacher, the one who has has given me so much, I have just betrayed. See, instead of turning back to Jesus, though, he decides to take matters into his own hands. And we see in Scripture that he actually took his own life because of the deep sorrow that he finds himself in. You know, in contrast, we see another character in the the book. We see Peter coming on. Now, in verse 33, Jesus has uh, just made this statement about going away into a place where they cannot come, right? So when you pick up Peter's account in verse 36, uh, uh, Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. You know, in this, again, Jesus is facing the shadow of of denial and betrayal and the cross. And all of this, you got to just imagine this being so difficult for all of them. I mean, here he is being told this, and he hates the fact that this is the reality of what's happening. But I want to continue just to dig on this a little bit more, because if you remember in Luke chapter 22, we see the same account from Luke's perspective, and he gives us a few more details. He, He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. See, Simon doesn't realize that he's a target. He doesn't realize that that Satan is gunning for him. But Jesus says in verse 32, But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. He says, you're going to fail me. It's going to happen. But when you realize it, repent and turn to me and then be strengthened for your other disciples, for, the, for your brothers in Christ who are going through these same kinds of struggles. He said, Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go to prison for you, even to die for you. That's the same thing uh, that John is saying. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that, even, that you even know me. You know, if I was Peter in that situation, I would feel just so sick. Because here, you got to remember that Jesus has never lied before. He's never even been wrong in his statements before. They know and realize this is going to happen. Just as he predicted Judas' betrayal, he tells Peter the future in these moments Peter hates to hear what is happening, and, you, and as you, we talked about last week, Peter has a knack for putting his foot in his mouth, and, and so then before Peter can get another word out, John records in verse 14, 1 through 4, uh, right after this, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, I just want to say this. After just hearing the news that he is going to betray Jesus three times before the sun comes up, The very next words out of Jesus' mouth, do not let your hearts be troubled. I don't know how Peter takes this. I think we see that it's a comfort to him. The same word as Jesus' spirit was troubled is the same word that's used here. Horrified, terrified, uncertain, uh, you know, just troubled beyond measure. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not true, if that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Verse 4, you know the way, the place where I am going. You know the way. You know the way because he is the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Verse 4 points to this, I think, very clearly. See, as we look at Peter's account and the refreshment that comes, here's what I want us to see is that for Peter, a wholehearted love for Jesus meant a wholehearted repentance. See, what we see in Peter's story is that, yes, the denial happens. It it, it takes place. And and he is cut to the heart. In fact, the Scripture says that that he whipped bitterly after he did this. After the rooster crowed, he ran away almost as if he was cursing because he was so sick of, of what he had just done. But I can't help but think that maybe Verse 14, do not let your heart be troubled. I have a place for you, Peter, if those words would not be ringing in his ears and in his heart. To know that the man who washed his feet and led him and loved on him and honored him as one of his disciples has told him, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But when it does, repent and turn. And then lead my church. Peter ended up being the rock of the church. He was used in powerful ways to launch the church into the future. See, what I want us to understand is that the difference between Peter and Judas is not that Jesus loved Peter more than Judas. It's not even that Peter was necessarily a better person than Judas. I mean, again, we don't have any recording of Judas putting his foot in his mouth, right? I mean, he seemed like a pretty solid guy through and through. What was in Judas, though, was the heart. It was a heart issue with him. So even though he denied him three times, even though he, he, he was in the darkness, instead of in his, in his repentance, instead of running from Jesus like Judas did, he ran toward Jesus. Powerful. See, here's what I want us to see the difference, to put it in a different way. Judas was marked by love, but it was a love of self. Judas had his own ideas of what he needed to be doing with his life. His own priorities, his own uh, uh, means of getting the job done. Peter was marked by love. But it was the selfless love of Jesus. That's the difference. You know, I I think about the church, even today with coronavirus and and all the worries and concerns and and anxiousness and all the things that, that are happening around us. One thing we must understand is that until we are marked by the selfless love of Jesus, the world will not know a difference. Because it makes all the difference. Just as much as a sumo wrestler, if you can imagine a a big sumo wrestler is not ready or equipped for a sprint race, (laughs) or a baby equipped or ready or has the capacity for flying a rocket in the same deficiency you and I if we have not been intimately marked by the love of Jesus then we will never be able to love each other as Christ loved us 
we will never be able to love our spouse like Christ loved us. We will never be able to love our neighbors in that way. We will never be able to love the person sitting across from you or beside you, the stranger across the street, or even the high calling of loving our enemies until we are marked by the selfless love. You know, as we consider the stress and the worries and the uncertainties, many of us are are marked by these. We are marked by the world because of the stress and the burdens, and it it is hard to be a lamp in the darkness. It is hard to be salt and light, to be moving on mission when we are bombarded with all these things. But until it is deeply embedded within us that Jesus loves us, Just as we are, will we only be able to experience joy in the midst of sorrow. That we will be able to turn fear into hope of glory. Be able to see the hand of God working in and amongst us. See, he loved his disciples. He loved the twelve so much. And he put it on full display, not just out of foot washing, but on the cross. He washed their sins white as snow. And as we consider that today, he loves us in the same way. Washing us white as snow. He knew that they were terrified, that they were horrified at the uncertainty. They were confused. They were unsure of what was going to happen. And yet... Just as much as he knew that about them, he knows that about us today. You know, as we, as we consider the way forward is Jesus, I think about in these moments when I read through Peter's letters. And in 1 Peter, there's a passage that's very familiar to us. He says, stay alert, watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And when I read this passage, I always think about just the, the mighty rock Peter and you know, him sort of you know, uh, proclaiming this with all confidence. But I got to say, in my study as I was reviewing this passage, in light of what Peter has gone through, I can't help but see two things. One, his warning, his caution is not without personal testimony. Stay alert. Watch out for the great enemy, the devil, because he was after me. And I denied Christ three times. I know what it is to fail him. I know what it is to to be in darkness and whip, whip bitterly because of what I've done. Watch out because he is powerful. He's a prowling around like a lion. My friend Judas, I spent three years with him in ministry. We were doing amazing things for, the, for God. He was in charge of the money. He was a great guy. But Satan got him. He prowled around like a lion and devoured him. Would you stay alert? Would you stand firm and keep the faith? See, until I looked at it through that lens, I've read this passage, I think, maybe in a different light. Because we realize that these are real men going through real things. And there's a real plea. Maybe many of you are going through that same thing right now whether it be the sickness, whether it be fear, anxiety, uh, financial pressure, trying to figure out how to do, live on minimum wage or figure out how to unemployment or whatever it is. You know, elderly are, are living in fear, trying to figure out how do we get to the grocery store? How do I get my medicine? How do I just navigate through all of this? And I just picture Satan prowling around looking for somebody to devour who's been walking in faith, who's been living intentionally and loving courageously, and then crisis hits and they just fold up shop. They walk away. 
because they're confused, they're concerned, they're worried. Would we hear Peter's warning, his caution? See, I want to ask us a more practical question because I appreciate Peter's challenge to us here. Stand firm against him. Be strong in our faith, right? We get that. But how do we? What's a practical way of doing that? I want to give you just one phrase that I think will help in a very practical sense. And actually, the, 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 the hat tip is found in verse 3. If you just look back with me, chapter 13 of John, verse 3, it's actually of Jesus. And in this, uh, we see, uh, I'll just read verse 2 and then get into 3. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And then here's verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his control, and that he had come from the Father and was returning to him. So he got up and began to wash the disciples' feet. See, what I realize in this moment, in that little little bit that John gives us, is that Jesus knew where he was from what his mission was while he was here, and when it was done, where he was going. He knew himself, and he knew what his call was to do in life. And so as we consider that, here's here's the the point that, that I think might be helpful. How do we keep on track? How do we, we, we remain faithful and steadfast? Be honest with yourself about yourself by knowing yourself. That's a mouthful, I, I, I know, but let's, let's let it sink in. Be honest with yourself about yourself by knowing yourself. Romans 12, uh, 3 says, Do not think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. You know, I got to be honest, I I know for myself and maybe some of you, we never really view us ourselves as bad as we probably really are. Now, I realize self-esteem issues and some of that stuff and and all that, but but I just want to say in general, I, I, I probably would bet that we probably don't view ourselves as like a Judas. I would wager that Peter probably didn't too, think too badly of himself. And yet, even in this moment, he denied Christ three times. If you were to rewind the clock and, and be friends with Judas, I just got to think that, that everybody in that room were so surprised that it was Judas. What? Judas? And I can't help but wonder if maybe Paul's on to something here in Romans 12. Do not think you are better than you really are. Be honest, honest, just honest in your evaluation of yourselves. And so I want to ask us some questions here. Um, what do you hope and dream about? What are your goals for your family, your future, your job, your career, your finances, your retirement, whatever it might be, right? What are the things that you are planning for and thinking about. Maybe some of that uncertainty, that that shadow stuff, is right in that ballpark. You're really unsure of what's going to happen next, right? Maybe that's a part of this. Maybe, I, I think maybe Judas had some ideas and dreams and goals of his own. See, he was hanging out with the right guy, the Messiah, the the miracle worker, the teacher. Everybody raved about Jesus. They loved Jesus. And he was on a fast track to power, prestige, probably a little bit of fame. And he had the purse. He had the money. But as soon as Jesus starts talking about dying, what? As soon as Jesus starts talking about humility, 
The greatest is the servant. What? Jesus, we're going to be rulers and conquerors. What do you mean? And all of a sudden, the selfishness begins to take over. Well, if he's going to die anyway, I might as well, instead of fighting the Pharisees, I might as well join him. I can't help but wonder if maybe we can even kind of relate to some of his thought process and how he approached life and his practicality and his, his uh, frugalness. Penny pinching. After all, he was one, one of the twelve that accused the woman of perform, the, that poured uh, perfume on Jesus' feet. He didn't like it. It was a waste to him. How are you doing Let's change topics. How are you doing with temptation? What's your attitude around temptation? How do you view money? How do you prioritize job, success, career? This morning in the Coffee with Darren, I talked about redeeming the time. How are you doing in redeeming the time? Are you stuck in the house only thinking about coronavirus? Is your thought process more God-centered or virus-centered? You know, my fear is that, that we would have an uptick in pornography, in heavy drinking, in, in self-harm, I heard on the radio that, that suicide is up because of this isolation. More calls are coming to 911 for people that are just really struggling. All right, Satan is prowling around like a lion. He wants to sabotage you. And if we don't take it serious, we're going to fall victim. Because we do not, we are not being honest with how we are really doing we're not being honest about ourselves with ourselves and we keep putting on the face oh i'm fine it'll be fine it'll be okay we'll get through it it's not that big a deal it's not that big a sin that's just for the time just for a season it's okay We must be honest with ourselves, about ourselves, with ourselves. By knowing, by knowing ourselves. Here's the knowing part. Here's what I want to to share with you a story. Becky and I had a privilege of getting married by a guy who's currently sick in the hospital. Pray for him, Dr. Walton. Um. Wonderful man of the Lord, professor at Central Christian College of the Bible. Shout out to them. And um, I can remember, we sat down with him, and he's a counseling professor, and uh, we took a Taylor Johnson temperament test. And if any counselors know that, I mean, that's, that's pretty, uh, you know, standard test. And the idea is to, man, to uh, measure temperaments and kind of see where you range. And so here's how it works. I took a test, Becky took a test, and then they took the test and laid them over each other and then saw where, uh, like how you paired with the other person. And uh, Becky can attest to this. We sat down uh, and it was the day of of reviewing our test. We'd taken a bunch of questions and it took quite a while to do and and finally we were getting the results. And I remember sitting down with uh, Becky and and we were excited to hear it and, and, and the beginning went pretty well. We were actually really complimentary of each other and all was was good. Until we got kind of toward the end. <laughs> and then there was a point that he kind of just like stops. And he, and he explained that, Darren, you are like off the charts. You're in the 90th percentile in host- hostility and dominance. Okay? Now, if you know me, that might not be a surprise to you. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but... Not only, he says, no, you know, one or the other that high, like that's, you know, that's going to be okay. But I got to say, like, that's a little bit, you know, concerning that both are that high. 
Well, the way it works is the temperament. So then the hostility and dominance have opposites, right? So the, the opposites are uh, submissive and tolerant, which is exactly where Becky pairs. She is off the charts on submissive and tolerant. And I'll never forget this. He, he, he gets to this portion of the test, and he looks me straight in the eyes, and he says, Darren, you make the perfect wife abuser, and she, Becky, makes the perfect victim. I mean, I seriously did not know what to do. I mean, I was legitimately worried. I thought, what? Like, are you kidding me? And I remember, I mean, it was such a shock to the system. I mean, I was terrified. I was like, wait, what are you saying? Like, really? And so what I did is I took his laptop and I said, you want to see hostile? I'll show you hostile. And I just went crazy on him, right? No, that's not what I did. I I didn't go too crazy. No, I'm kidding. I I sat there and I had a wake-up call is what happened. Because I realized in that moment that there were some, some things in me that weren't right. And if I'm going to marry this amazing woman, I can't be taking advantage of her. I, I don't want to be laying a hand on her. And so when we got married, we knew that these are sort of like areas of tension for us. And it, we're, here we, we've celebrated 10 years. We're so thankful for that. It's been a great, and we're looking forward to another 10. And praise God, I haven't ra- put a hand on her in any sort of like house, you know, wife beater kind of way. Um, but that's what I mean. Be honest with yourself about yourself by knowing, knowing yourself. If I don't realize how dominant and hostile I can be, that's going to make a rough marriage. That's going to be rough in parenting. That's going to be rough in pastoring. That's going to be rough in every area because I'm just going to be mean and honorary to everybody, right? Becky, in, in the same way, if, if she just continually is, is overly submissive and tolerant about everything, that's not going to be healthy either. And so we have taken time and specifically worked on these things. As we stay on the right track, as we pursue Jesus, I think we have to be honest with our weaknesses and bold with our strengths, right? But that's a part of being honest with yourself about yourself and knowing yourself. And if you can be intentional about refining who you are, being created in the image of God, you will be able to be a force that God will use for his glory. Yes, there's going to be times where you might be weeping bitterly. You might, and there will be times when you will be repenting. Yes, there's going to be times when you need to turn and allow Jesus to wash those dirty, rotten feet. But he wants you to. That's what he came to the cross for. And so the key of being honest with yourself about yourself is by knowing yourself. So let me just ask you a few questions and then we're going to close. Do you have addictive personalities? How, does your family have history of addiction? And in knowing that, how can you set yourself up to be accountable? That's what knowing yourself gives you the ability to do. It's a tool in your tool bag. Um, how do you do with wrestling with anxiety? What are some things that you've done to, to cope with that? Getting counseling maybe using medication, whatever it is that you need, but setting up tools to be able to cope with that stress and anxiety that might be just burdening you right now. All right, maybe, maybe part of that is turning off the TV. <laughs> we can watch coronavirus stuff 24-7. It's on our news feed. It's on Facebook. I mean, anywhere you go, man, it's there. But maybe, just maybe, you need to turn that off for a while. You know, I, I listened to uh, Stephen uh, uh, Furtick, and he was mentioning about how we often will feed ourselves fear, but pray for peace. 
How many of us do that? Where we feed ourselves fear, but we pray for peace. That doesn't make sense. That's not a recipe for success. We're setting ourselves up to fail. How do you do with anxiety? Maybe you're like me. You struggle, you struggle with that, that short temper, right? You struggle with, with hostility, right? I'm right there with you. So how do you focus that? How do you channel that energy? How do you channel that focus to be able to, in a healthy way, uh, move past that? So you can still pursue the kingdom of God. You can still uh, give him glory with your life and not be wrecking the people around you. See, what I love about going a little bit deeper into these sort of tough areas is that the deeper we go, the more amazing we realize the grace of God is and that selfless love that Jesus is offering. And as we continue to embed that in our lives, the anger by the Spirit of God is turned to joy. The, the anxiety by the power of God can be turned to peace. The surrendering of these things will give God the glory because we're not doing it in our own strength. It's what He is doing through us. And that is what I believe the mark of love that the world sees and will truly be in awe of. Can I pray for you? Father in heaven, I want to thank you for Jesus. God, I want to thank you for that selfless love that he gave because God, you were so good. And Father, I pray that as we navigate in these next days and weeks and months ahead, would this message be, be helpful, be a practical tool to, to help us understand who you are and what you're doing in, in a great way. God, I pray for all of those dealing with the stress and anxiety and the burdens of temptation, the reality of financial pressures, and, and all of that comes with. God, I just lift them up to you right now. If they are in the, the sound of my voice, God, I pray that you would lift them up and bring peace, bring rejoicing. God, allow it to be something that is just so remarkably unique that they can only identify because of Jesus. Father, thank you for who you are and what you're doing in this church, in our families. Would you help us and give us strength through the next days and weeks ahead? Would you get the glory for all that we do, thank you, Jesus, for your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
together with our closing song.